Um, so thanks everybody for coming. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Aileen Kitching. So uh, she's a public health uh, consultant in the HSC South. So uh, Dr. Kitching has a, I suppose, a wealth of experience working in um, communicable disease control. And today she's going to speak to us about her experience in the Philippines um, as part of the response team there. So thank you very okay, much. Okay, thanks Fiona. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, so I'll just get on to the presentation. So just to give you an overview of what I'm going to cover in the presentation. So I'm going to show you a short video um, to begin with and uh, it was made by WHO um, while I was there during the response um, so you don't have to listen to me the whole time um, and uh, talk a little bit about the context and what, it was, what was happening actually there on the ground and um, how I got there and um, so what the process was for applying and actually uh, getting involved in the work and then um, what it was like in Tecloban City where I was based. So getting to grips with the role that I was given and um, some key pieces of work and looking at how public health skills could be applied in that setting and then a few lessons learned um, along the way. So we'll just start with the video. Um. <laughs> Tapos uh, biglang nagkaroon ng wave, nagulat kami. Tapos pumunta kami ng taas. Nung nasa taas na kami, hindi kami mabuksan ng asawa ko dahil ang akala niya ay walang tumakatok. Just a minute. Biglang nawala ang bahay namin dito sa likuran. On November 8, 2013, a typhoon swept across the Visayas Islands in the Philippines. The typhoon, known as Haiyan or Yolanda locally, affected over 16 million people. Six months later, the communities affected are slowly recovering. The World Health Organization, or WHO, has worked alongside the government of the Philippines and health organizations to provide immediate and longer-term health care to all those who need it. WHO's role during an emergency like Typhoon Yolanda is to support the government in coordinating all of the relief efforts to make sure that people have the health uh, needs and supplies and drugs that they require. And then immediately afterwards, we were able to get staff on the ground with supplies to begin to help that relief operation. We supported the government in coordinating over 150 foreign medical teams that came with their supplies, their mobile hospitals, to help the people of the Philippines. The typhoon destroyed 582 public health facilities. Priority has been to get these repaired and get equipment and supplies in place to treat all those who need it. The WHO has mapped which health clinics and hospitals most need repairing to help the government focus foreign aid and financial support. In the aftermath of a disaster, a new life is more precious than ever. In the six months since the typhoon struck, over 84,000 babies have been born in the areas affected. Now the WHO is working to make sure there are enough facilities for the thousands of children due to be born in the coming months. To prevent the spread of disease, the WHO helped organize a vaccination campaign in the areas affected by the typhoon. Over 108,000 children were immunized for measles and almost 50,000 for polio in typhoon-affected communities. Disease is also spread through dirty water. The typhoon destroyed vital supplies of clean water, both for drinking and washing. The WHO has been working to get clean water to those who need it, making sure there is regular inspection of water supplies to measure how clean the water really is, and teaching communities to make sure their water is clean. In the aftermath of an emergency, many people have a hard time adjusting. Some are bereaved, some newly disabled. Some have worked hard to help others and now are overcome themselves. I am Gloria Camorne, senior nurse of the Alvin and the Rabin Hospital in Malangi, Eastern Sama, which was devastated by the typhoon Yolanda. I am thankful that many chiefs are coming here because on that day, we are, we, I came here in the hospital at 8 o'clock and many patients are coming, injured patients with different kinds of bones and we have a limited stuff, like for example, for the anesthesia. 
The WHO has been training local health workers in psychological first aid. This gives immediate support to those most affected. People are encouraged to listen to one another, to look out for signs of distress, and if needed, link people to the mental health services they needed. For children, it can be as simple as finding them a space to play. The real hard work of rebuilding the health system has begun. WHO is supporting the government on the rebuild of some health facilities, on coordinating international efforts to get those hospitals and health clinics back up and running, but also making sure that where there are gaps in services, for example maternity services or newborn uh, child services, mental health, that we're able to help support filling those gaps as well so that the affected population really can get back on its feet as quickly as possible and we have a robust and resilient health system moving forward. just to give you a bit of a kind of an overview of the different public health aspects of the response. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about the typhoon. So this was a super, typh a super typhoon is how they describe it, um, Yolanda, and it hit the Philippines at peak strength, which is quite unusual. Um, so it made landfall initially in the eastern part of the Philippines and then moved westwards. And it was the strongest tropical cyclone to make landfall in recorded history. So it was, it was really, really huge. Um, with maximum sustained winds of 230 kilometres an hour and with gusts reaching 315 kilometres an hour at some points. So it, it really was um, phenomenal. And it was a Category 5 storm and it was associated with a storm surge, which is an intense low pressure at the storm centre, which effectively sucks the sea upwards, sending waves as high as 15 feet, um, you know, ashore on the islands of Leyte and uh, Samar, um, with the impact comparable to that of a tsunami. Um, it caused extensive damage to life, homes, livelihoods and infrastructure um, across nine of the Philippines' poorest provinces, um, with the port city of Tacloban um, being among the most severely affected areas, and 90% of its infrastructure was completely destroyed by, by the typhoon. Um, and I suppose this was, um, I suppose, one of the first lessons that I felt I, I kind of learned uh, during this in how we communicate risk in a way that is meaningful to populations and to communities. Um, describing the wave for the, as a storm surge had less meaning for people than if it had been described as a tsunami. So while the storm surge was technically accurate, the impact was that of a tsunami. And because it wasn't called a tsunami, many people didn't evacuate. Um, even though they were advised to, so there were many, many more lives lost than, than needed to be. Um, so it's, uh, it's so something important to consider, how do we communicate risk, risk to communities? Um, so how did I end up going there? Um, well, I'm not sure if you know about GORN. Does anybody know about GORN? So GORN is the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. So it's coordinated, the Secretariat is housed with WHO, in Geneva, so it's a mechanism coordinated by them, but effectively it's a partnership or a network of public health institutes globally um, around the world. And um, the kind of agreement or the basic agreement that countries who sign this memorandum with WHO just to be part of the network is that they release staff to help support um, outbreaks or emergencies like this. Um, the staff are generally released on what's a $1 contract with a WHO, so their salaries continue to be paid by their host or their sending institutes, but WHO support in every other way, kind of with flights, accommodation, financially on the, on the ground. Um, and they send calls out through a number of different mechanisms. Um, uh, actually, at the moment, they're also looking for universities uh, to partner with them as be part of this network. Um, but a lot of their partnerships would be like, say, for example, HPSC, uh, which is part of the HSC. Here's the Health Protection Surveillance Centre. Um, a lot of the National Public Health Institutes that are involved in communicable disease control. Um, so I, my response in going was to the second call they put out because they were really, really needing a lot of staff and they didn't have enough people coming to help support the response. 
Um, so I'd received it at work. I was working in Public Health England um, at the time, so I received it through two separate kind of chains. Um, so I was certainly doing the rounds, and it was requesting um, the number of uh, a number of different roles, people to fulfil a number of roles. So information knowledge management officers, epidemiology surveillance officers, surveillance team coordinators, and health cluster coordinators. And my initial thoughts was, okay, there are two roles I'm suitable for and that I can do, and so I think I'll try and apply for those. Um, so at the time I was on the public health training scheme in London, um, so I got approval from my education supervisor that I could send my CV off. Um, and about 10 days later I got a phone call from the head of WHO in country asking if I'd consider taking on a more senior role um, rather than the ones I'd applied for. Um, her background, Julie, who you saw in the video, uh, I used to be a GP, so she was also a GP in her former life and then did public health training. So I think she thought, okay, I know what kind of skill set or mixed skill set you'll have, and I think you could do in different roles. But as it turned out, when I got the actual offer, the request from Gorn asking for my deployment was as a surveillance team coordinator, so um, I was quite happy with that at the time. Um, so before you go, you have pre-departure medical, you have to get uh, forms and visas. Um, and I suppose what was very interesting was to have foreign government official kind of put down on my passport. And that was my first experience also of um, dealing with uh, Philippine people, the Filipinos. Um, when I went to apply for my visa, I'd applied for a business visa, paid for it, um, a kind of a three month, covered three months business visa. When I went back to collect it, they said, oh, we don't have your visa. Um, this, you need to sit down and wait over there. Um, it kind of, and somebody needs to come down and talk to you. And I thought, oh no, I'm leaving on Friday. <laughs> I need the visa. And um, when the lady came down from the visa office, she handed me back all my money. And instead of giving me single entry business visa, they gave me multiple entry visa for months, like six months and longer. And she said, no, we're not taking your money. You're coming to help us, you know, which was really a, a lovely indication of what the people and the warmth um, and the welcome that we would get, you know, by going there to help with the response. And then uh, the flight was planned for um, the 11th of March and the initial plan was to go and deploy there for eight weeks. So I suppose it kind of took about a month really to get everything from the time when I initially expressed, expressed interest. Um, so on arrival, WHO sent a car to meet you at the airport and then the next day I went off to the country office and then I realised the terms of reference for my job had been sent and it was a completely different job to what I had been expecting or what role I thought I was going to be in. Um, I was up on a board as being um, health cluster coordinator for Tech Loban City. I didn't even know what a health cluster <laughs> coordinator was at that stage. And I also was up on the board as the coordinator for the whole region for an uh, extensive list of programmes um, around maternal and child health, uh, mental health, psychosocial support, nutrition, non-communicable diseases and management of the dead. And as if that wasn't enough, um, I also realised there was a colleague coming who was the director of public health in England. He was he's he actually from Cork, um, but he's director of public health in, in South East England. Jim was coming to take on a role as team leader for the region in about 10 days' time. But meanwhile, um, before he came, I was going to be team leader um, as well. So uh, it was a lot to take in. And so I was going to have geographic area responsibility as well as kind of topic area responsibility and to manage the team in Tacloban um, when I would get there. So I must say this was my initial <laughs> thoughts, was get me, get me out of here. What have, what have I just done? Um, so I suppose there's something around another lesson to learn about knowing what you're actually agreeing to before you go somewhere. Um, but I suppose also take some of the opportunities you're offered. And in these kind of scenarios, it's really important that you're flexible and um, willing to, I suppose, at least give it a shot. There was nobody else there to do it. So I kind of really didn't have much choice. Um, so my first thoughts, well, I don't even know what is the health cluster. Like, um, So a cluster really is a group of agencies, organisations and institutions which are in interconnected by their respective mandates and working together towards um, common objectives. And um, so there's 11 clusters. This was set up as part of global humanitarian reform. Um, a number of clusters that would have specific UN agency leads. So WHO leads for health, nutrition, uh, it's UNICEF. UNICEF are also water and sanitation, UNDP, the development programme, or early recovery, um, and so on. And the aim of this cluster approach was really to procure a more effective, coordinated and coherent humanitarian response. Um, it was introduced as part of humanitarian reform and the idea is about strengthening 
system-wide preparedness and technical capacity, while at the same time ensuring this predictable leadership so everybody knows WHO will lead the health cluster, and also enhancing, enhancing accountability and transparency. So how does it work? Uh, so if there is a national disa natural disaster or conflict in a region, um, OCHA, which is the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, it's part of the UN. These, the Emergency Relief Coordinator for OCHA is also the UN Deputy Secretary General. So she appoints, or it was Valerie Amos at the time, so she appoints a humanitarian coordinator um, for the country um, to ensure the response efforts are well organised. So it's about coordination. Um, this person is responsible for coordinating the humanitarian activities of the UN agencies and the international um, NGOs in consultation with the national authorities, and that's really important. We are there to support the national response, not to replace it um, or to tell people what to do. And sometimes, um, depending on the context and the response and the capacity on the ground, um, there's peripheral health clusters set up as well as um, the kind of national health cluster and this is what happened um, in Yolanda um, so to better respond to the needs of the population so Tacloban or the Palo hub was one of these um, and that's where I was going. So the health cluster coordinator role is to ensure good performance of the health cluster um, which could mean a lot of things I suppose effectively the performance is monitored and evaluated according to the extent by which the activities and programs of the cluster partners meet the health needs of the crisis affected population so that's kind of really to summarize what what the role was so that there's a number of different aspects to to that role so just the context in Tacloban and where i was going so since yolanda there'd been a really high turnover of a large volume of staff in the hub and in particular for the health cluster coordinator role um, some health cluster coordinators had been there for as little as one or two weeks and others within the team had been acting up as health cluster coordinators in between people who were formally appointed. So there was no handover of briefing notes on arrival and you know it really was quite an unstable situation. So they did need stability in the role, particularly when I arrived as we were in the transition phase at that point from response to early recovery was how it would be described. Um, so. The weekend after I arrived was spent on briefing meetings all weekend, lots to read and lots and lots of kind of phone calls and meetings to try and get my head around what the job was and stepping into a more kind of senior role as well. Um, so I arrived in Tacloban on St. Patrick's Day, um, <laughs> four months after the typhoon had hit. Um, so the first thing that struck me when I arrived into the airport, um, flights were only allowed in at certain times of the day because there was no electricity. Um, so there was no runway strip. So you could only fly when it was daylight. Um, and um, so the flights would arrive in. There was no windows anywhere. Like the building was just kind of holding together. Um, so, you know, you could walk out onto the runway. There was very little kind of structure to stop you from accessing um, the runway and um, there was no real luggage carousel the bags were taken off the plane dumped on the carousel and then you picked it up just from there but there was nothing working as I said because there was no electricity and then driving from the airport you could see that many people were still living in tents and this is four months after after the typhoon had hit and you can see in this picture um, how much of the city was destroyed as I said 90% of the infrastructure was destroyed um, and the areas in red were those that were, you know, really heavily destroyed. There was very, very little, little left. Um, that's a before and after shot of an area that area circles near the coastline. If you can see that white dot, that was the convention centre for the city. And um, when the, it was one of the places for evacuation of people in the event, because they get a lot of typhoons and storms um, there. So it was one of the designated evacuation places. But it's right on the shoreline, so like three or four hundred people were sheltering there from the storm. But then when the wave hit, they were all killed, like um, you know, because people didn't move far enough inland. Um, and you can see also like this buildings on the left. You can see on the right, there's very little left around it. Like things were like it was like matchsticks. Everything was just completely, completely destroyed. Now that's a devastated area, kind of, which was quite close to the airport. Um, and then there was a lot of flooding kind of more inland so this is about half a mile from in from the coast there was a lot a lot of flooding um, you can see the picture on the left the extent of the damage just that everything was completely crushed 
Um, and you can see on the right, um, I don't know if you can s read um, what's written, somebody has written, into the ground we need food, and another sign, help us. Um, so this is people who'd arrived immediately after the typhoon in the days afterwards said um, that like a lot of buildings, people would have gotten paint or whatever they could and written SOS or please help us on buildings. But one colleague who'd worked in Haiti uh, before, he said he'd seen one thing here that he'd never seen anywhere else, that a number of days later people started writing thank you. Um, you know, on roofs and whatever. So that it was again another kind of reflection of what the communities were really were like. And this for me was one of the defining images of the typhoon. And these ships were still there when I got there. Um, there was six huge massive trawlers that were just that by the force of the wave washed into the city. Um, and there was um, so like and, and these were like they really were like huge um, and uh, like there was no way of really getting them out again, um, and for me it was this was the defining power of nature, you know, um, that we often completely underestimate. And they were still there when I arrived, so there had been very very little slow progress, but people had started building shelters um, underneath them and rebuilding huts and houses. So like there was a sign there, "Welcome to Yolanda Village." Like obviously the sense of humour hadn't <laughs> completely. Um, you know, died uh, during the time, but it was there was still obviously significant need and still lots and lots to do. Um, so there was a lot of uh, foreign medical teams that were there that are the Gorn partners. So as I said, Gorn is made up of multiple institutions, and more than two hundred short-term consultants have been deployed through Gorn. I'd highlighted um, in red and the various ones that were there from the UK. Unfortunately, there was no deployees from Ireland um, through Gorn who were there. Um, and so there was a significant amount of teams to coordinate, and this is part of the cluster coordinator role. Um, so in the, at least in the initial stage of the response. Now, um, thankfully, by the time I'd gotten there, the number of teams had diminished significantly, but there still would be quite a number of international NGOs or you know, at, at the various meetings um, and that during the response. This was some of our local team. People came from all over. So um, KB was from WHO headquarters. People came from the local offices within the Philippines, the non-affected areas. So some from the country office. There was two other colleagues from uh, PHE who were there with me. Addis had deployed also through Gorn, but uh, Jim was a direct secondment um, from Public Health England to the WHO Philippines office. So it didn't go through that same kind of mechanism. Um, there was others there from Gorn, from the States, from France, from all over, and then there was others seconded from other agencies, so like um, CDC in Atlanta or IMAP, and Stephanie was there just to do mapping. You know, that was kind of her role. So there was hu like a huge variety of skill sets and people with varying degrees of experience who, who were there. Um, so just to talk a little bit about then the role and what I ended up doing when I was there. Um, so coordination representation was a, a big part of it, so around identifying uh, relevant stakeholders and engaging them in meetings, trying to mobilise partners that provide leadership and strategic direction, representing the cluster in uh, various um, meetings, uh, and then building back better was what it was called, so ensuring there was appropriate links among the humanitarian actions and the longer term health sector plans. So just a little bit about the coordination and representation. What did that actually mean? Lots of meetings. So there was a lot of meetings. So with um, OCHA, so the Uni Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, then we'd have these random meetings. So anyone who wanted to get involved in health sector rebuilding or response, and uh, because we were coordinating the health cluster, um, OCHA would send them to us for discussions. So you'd end up in discussions with the US military or um, you know, um, different Pacific partnerships. Um, or various um, different uh, for actors from other um, from other sectors. So that was quite quite interesting. Um, I end up in a meeting with Helen Clark, who's the head of UNDP, so she'd be the equivalent of Margaret Chan for WHO. Um, lots of cluster meetings. So we had the city cluster meetings and the regional uh, cluster meetings. Um, lots of meetings in the city health office in the Department of Health, so the local, the regional Ministry of Health, and then bilateral meetings with partners that we were trying to get to maybe do something um, on the ground uh, as part of the response. 
Um, we also had some celebrities who came. I wasn't there when David Beckham came, but uh, or Justin Bieber. Actually, he was there as well. Um, he wasn't very popular, but <laughs> um, you know. Um, but I was there on a meeting with uh, this Filipina celebrity, uh, Jodie Santa Maria, who is um, she's got one million Twitter followers and one million Instagram followers. Is Emmy nominated and hugely popular. Um, I've never seen anything like the hysteria that greeted her kind of arrival in this in this community. But it was actually really, really wonderful, the impact she had. She actually was a medical student at one point before her career took off and then left university to concentrate on her television career. Um, so she had a real feeling for the health side of things and she's been a WHO ambassador for a number of years. And I suppose I would have been a little bit dubious initially, but when I saw the impact she had on the ground talking to mothers around, you know, breastfeeding or just various other aspects of kind of healthcare and setting, it, it was really wonderful. And it was uh, lovely the, what, how much it meant to the community that she visited, um, you know, when they were in such a difficult time. So I suppose with another thing around not underestimating actually the power of celebrity at community level and trying to use, utilize it to try and achieve something. Um, especially if you've got a very willing person. Um, so another aspect of the role was around gathering information, assessing needs, and trying to promote best practice and delivery. Um, so this was really around initially, the four Ws is what they're called, to collect these kind of indicators across the cluster. So who is where, since, and until when, and what are they actually doing? So for all the NGOs. Um, then looking at the availability of health services in the crisis areas um, and what's been delivered to the population by any of the NGOs working in health. Um, looking at any gaps that can't be covered by any of the partners we have and trying to see who could fill them. Do we need to get somebody in or what can we do as WHO to fill any gaps? And then looking at any urgent training needs around technical standards, protocols for delivery of key health services. Um, then we would feedback this information gathers um, through regular reports and through health cluster bulletins and then try and promote kind of adherence to best standards and practices. Um, so for example, in terms like things like, um, uh, there was a lot of donations of medical drugs, but not all were complying with what was Philippines national policy around accepting drug donations. So that would be one kind of key area. Um, so then around gathering, so gathering information, assessing needs and promoting best practice and delivery. So uh, I suppose the, one of the main things I was involved in or leading on was a health facility recovery assessment. So I did this jointly with the city health office um, and it was looking at recovery and looking at what needs were there. So we took a mixed methods approach, uh, interviews with key people from the local government unit, the city health office and barangays, which were like local areas. Um, so each would have their own council and all these, the barangays made up the city, kind of the whole city area. So it was like small areas. Um, looking at information in key documents, so previous city health office reports, any assessment visits that have been done maybe by WHO or other NGOs. And then by the end of May, I'd completed site visits to 40 health facilities, uh, six district health centres and 34, which were called Barangay Health Stations or health centres in seven districts and looking at previous damage. So what was the damage, what quick fixes or any rehabilitation had been done already and who had done it and when? Uh, what was the current service capacity and delivery around basic primary care, antenatal care, family planning, um, EPI, which is the expanded program on immunisation and looking at birthing facilities? And what were the challenges to service delivery? So what were the rehabilitation needs still in the health facilities? What equipment did they need? Did they need trained staff or any staff? Um, and then we mapped every health facility. Um, to try and inform a national register so that they would have a log of what was there um, for future future reference. So what did we find? There was still... Yep? Um, just a question on that. What, how did you maintain uh, like your like, uh, organisation of your, of your field network, qualitative field nets, in such a chaotic situation? How do you mean, how did I make like, 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 um, like on the, on the previous slide, mm -hmm. you said you had a mixed methods approach, right? Yeah. So you, so you used qualitative. Do you, you use qualitative? No, it was quantitative. Do you use quantitative? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I did forty. I did all the field visits and took notes at every one. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> According to a template that that's, I'd drawn up beforehand. 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is did you how how are you able to stay so organized without you know? Um, in such a if I get a like sleep. <laughs> um, well, you know, we had a stable office, uh-huh. you know, um, and like we were in a safe area. There wasn't any kind of, you know, it was a house that was way up on a hill, um, and that's what we used as our office. So, um, yeah, so. Um, I didn't know that's. Yeah, no, no. That no. makes sense because if you were in the middle of everything, well. No, well, I, I, I was there four months afterwards, okay. you know, and there were like up in the hills by the city, there were um, some areas that, um, you know, and we had to, like, we'd have a generator for electricity. There wasn't electricity in the city, there was no traffic lights, mm-hmm. like in the city, um, you know, until about a week before I left, um, you know, so yeah. Um, so I suppose we identified that the urgent needs were in relation to health facility rehabilitation in certain parts of the city, any g- gaps in basic primary care at kind of the Barangay Health Station or Health Centre level, and there was a lack of safe institutional deliveries. So really, there was no proper birthing facilities outside the tertiary referral hospital. Um, huge gaps in the cold chain in terms of vaccine um, management and huge gaps in healthcare waste management at any of all the facilities. So there was a real need for application of kind of really basic public health uh, skills in this setting. Um, So in terms of the basic primary care, many facilities lacked really just basic equipment, stethoscopes, blood pressure cuffs, height boards, weighing scales, examination beds and tables. There was, there'd been doors missing, there was roofs falling in, people were paying themselves to get stuff repaired or hanging up doors themselves because there was no kind of organised or very little organised approach to to all of this um, or in many areas. Um, The lack of safe institutional deliveries was a big problem. There had been four district health centres that had birthing facilities that had been supposedly rehabilitated since the typhoon, but none of them had delivered one baby since happened. So everybody was saying, oh, but we have these health centres, they're rehabilitated. When I went in, none of them were delivering babies. None had running water, safe running water. Um, three had no healthcare staff out of hours, so they couldn't. So if someone came, you know, and was going to be in a labour for after five pm, there was no one there to deal with it. Um, and three lacked basic equipment, really. So um, there was significant issues. Um, in the previous year, there'd been more than six thousand deliveries in the city. Um, now three, almost three and a half thousand, were in hospital, but that left a lot that were happening outside hospital that had been either in the health centres or you know at more kind of local level. Um, the city hospital wasn't rehabilitated so they couldn't go there so we had a tertiary referral hospital for the whole reason that everybody was was going to and the impact on that was like it was literally bursting at the seams so this was clearly not sustainable. Um, so we worked with the city health office um, and got them to focus on three of the four rehabilitated health centres to try and give a 24-hour service. So they mobilised 40 staff uh, to Tacloba, newly qualified nurses and midwives, and then through the health clusters at the city and at the regional level, we advocated with the city government to turn back on the electricity and or sort out the water issue, and with different international NGOs and with the Department of Health also um, in terms of basic equipment. Um, the cold chain then was another big issue. There was no vaccine fridges outside of the main health centre. Uh, kitchen fridges were being used for vaccines, which is not appropriate. Um, and so by the end of May, we'd worked with UNICEF uh, to get them to supply the three health centres we were focusing on, at least that they would have um, proper vaccine fridges. And this was really important because they were planning a big national immunisation cam- campaign in September, which wouldn't have been possible if you couldn't ha- store the vaccines effectively um, in these health centres. There was one specific area of the city um, that uh, was a really, I suppose, a significant unmet need. And this was this area called Magellanas. Um, and they had had, um, their health station was within this 40 metre no build zone. So this was the kind of considered the unsafe area close to the shoreline in case another, um, you know, typhoon happened and another storm surge. But they covered um, 10 barangay areas with a catchment population of almost 12,000 uh, people. And they had a hundred, more than a hundred of these, what they called um, NHTS families. It was a national kind of poverty reduction strategy. So they were families, I suppose, effectively like means testing. And um, so they were identified as being the poorest of the poor. And there was a very high teenage pregnancy rate. You know, it was just a really, really deprived area. 
and politically it was um, in the area of the opposition territory from the mayor. Um, so it had been the mayor was Mel de Marcus's nephew, um, and so it was like very very political what was happening as well. And this area had kind of really been overlooked or neg neglected quite a bit. Um, it was almost three kilometres from the closest district health centre and eight kilometres from a hospital. So there really weren't alternatives for the people living there. And um, the midwife who was kind of looking after that area, she had been initially in a tent um, trying to deliver basic primary care and then in a temporary facility in this what was called a Tanod outpost, which was like a little police station. Um, so she was trying to deliver care there and delivering just vaccinations um, and some partial prenatal care, but there was no bed to examine anyone on. So really it was all standing up kind of care and trying to give vaccinations. And that's her with some of her um, her community community staff. Um, <coughs> so we tried to look at what were the options for providing an alternative facility. Um, so this is what was left of the health station, like it was right on the shoreline. Um, and it was within this 40 metre no build zone. So it was too close to the shoreline to rehabilitate. So this wasn't an option. Um, there was further back inland, there was another area, a damaged market um, area. Um, but this was also within the no build zone. So we couldn't, we wouldn't have gotten permission to kind of rehabilitate that either. So this was also had to be discounted. Um, then I went looking around what was nearby in terms of kind of land. Um, there was land at a school in the next barangay um, area. They had utilities in place, they had latrines, they had a water source, but th they were using the land, they said, for to build, someone had promised to build them extra classrooms so they wouldn't give us any land, even though like a health facility was more of an urgent need for the, for the area. Um, so that had to be discounted and then we looked at a number of kind of roadside locations um, but there was insufficient space for a mobile clinic and I should say I wasn't looking at all this on my own we had a really good engineer in our team and um, so I brought, he went with me and we looked at all the various options and what we would what we would need and um, so these options were discounted as well so then we thought okay let's go back to this Tanod outpost we know it doesn't really belong to the health office of the city it belongs to the council and the police um, and let's explore what we could do with this um you know it was a small building and it needed a lot of work but it actually was a good a good location and it was outside the 40 meter no build zone so um after some discussion we managed to persuade the local council to sign over the building to the health office um, um, so that we, WHO could rehabilitate it as a, as a health centre. Um, so they gave us that, that permission. Um, and the new clinic opened um, at the end of uh, June. So this was um, about seven weeks after the initial assessment visit. Um, we'd managed to get the clinic rehabilitated and, and open again. Um, so this is Gina, who was the midwife, and that was the chairman of the local council, who was very pleased to have this in his area not going to another area um so yeah so it was great it was really really great to um to manage to get that um f for for that for that community um so this is just one of the infographics that who developed kind of around um the extent of kind of need after the typhoon so 16 minutes at six months on 16 million people affected uh, there have been a ho more than 150 foreign medical teams um, 582 public health facilities assessed and mapped, over 100,000 children vaccinated, um, tons of medical supplies and six health cluster hubs. So a huge amount of logistical effort and work. Um, but there was still a lot of outstanding health priorities 